Yeah, I hear you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, see if I can share my screen. We'll go ahead and uh, and bring this thing up and see if we can't get started. Thank you guys all for joining. And uh, let's see, share screen. This is the one I want. And then I want to go to this. Those. How's that look? Excellent. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, thank you guys all very much for taking time out of your day to attend our Grease Lake Dealer uh, training meeting here. We're going to talk about uh, system sizing and installation. So we're going to do a quick run through of the products that are available and just talk about some of the installation best practices. So today we've got uh, myself here. And my counterpart, Mr. Daniel Hamry. Good morning, everyone. Good to be here with you, Keith. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel's Director of Training of, tech, of Technical Support. So we're working uh, diligently on ways to help you guys solve problems quickly in the field, identify issues, and, uh, and just make the information clearer. So we'll go ahead and start running through this. Um, and I always like to mention, you know, GREE has been around since 1991, making mini splits. And so they're really uh, one of the best products on the market. I put their quality up against anything out there. Uh, over 90,000 employees, uh, 11 factories, and they manufacture everything. So they manufacture compressors, motors, um, printed circuit boards, injection mold, plastic, stamp metals. They do the whole thing. So uh, it really gives them a lot of, uh, control over the quality of the product. If there's ever anything going wrong in the chain, they have full control over it. So um, outstanding product and a really, really solid track record of success. So we appreciate having you guys on board. Hope you feel the same way. And uh, lots of engineers on staff, 15,000 engineers, research institutes, labs, a uh, lot of testing uh, goes on with all the different uh, products and they hold a lot of patents, technology patents and invention patents. So some of these technologies we'll be talking about are the best in the industry, uh, best in class, and, um, and we're the only ones that have it. So another advantage for you guys out there. And we appreciate you being on board as a Gree Select dealer. Again, you get that 10-year warranty. You do have to register. So you log into your Gree Select dealer login, register those products, and you'll get the 10-year warranty. Otherwise, it just defaults to the uh, standard 5.7. Uh, but you do get your starter kit and you do get your points and uh, with a gift card to use any way you like at the end of the year. Uh, but the other really important thing is we're trying to drive, uh, we want qualified installers and um, we're trying to drive business your way by putting you on that Gree Select dealer locator. So anyone in your area types in zip code, your name comes up as an authorized uh, installer of the Gree products. So we want to continue to support you, though, so that uh, so that you know as much about this stuff as as possible. And um, if you haven't signed up to be a Gree Select dealer, I mean that should be uh, who's here today. But uh, it's very easy. Go to the contractors tab, become a Gree Select dealer today. Super easy to sign up. Uh, there's some qualifications there that you can read through. But uh, our rebates tab is great too. So if you're on the job trying to help, uh, trying to make a sale. Rebates can really drive customers uh, one direction or another, and uh, sometimes even uh, from one product to another uh, might be really worthwhile. We've seen some just insane rebates. Uh, one area in the Northeast, uh, New England states, uh, they have rebates as high as $10,000 uh, that show up on these rebate tabs. So when you click on that tab, you'll get this page, customer types a zip code in, and uh, basically it, it lets them know every GREE product that has a rebate. And when you click on the little blue button that says like a Vireo Gen 3, one rebate, it'll tell you how much that rebate is and what, what they're uh, applying that to. Uh, in some cases, there may be more than one rebate. And that's what I saw with the New England stuff is um, two rebates, the $10,000. And then there's another, like a tax break uh, style rebate. So really, really uh, strong. That's incredible. So, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, I used to get a lot of questions about rebates. I'm so happy that they put this on the website because I I didn't, you know, I wasn't up to speed on the rebates. And yeah. 
where they where they you know where they were and how to find them and find out for your area so that's a really good new feature we've got simple easy tool and uh you know not only do we have really world-class literature we have beautiful literature out there uh, that you can share with customers some videos and things uh, to explain the product a little better uh, and then and the rebates and stuff so you don't have to be as much of a salesman you can use these tools and uh, show the homeowner while you're looking at the job and uh, deciding what they need so uh, anything that anything additional that we can do to help you please let us know as well um, this is all the latest greatest you know uh, g10 inverter technology stuff from GRI minus 31 heating products uh, all the way up to 129 uh, for air conditioning. And we have some products too that are minus 22 heating and minus 20 for cooling. So if you're working on server rooms or places that you need to continue to run air conditioning, even in cold outdoor ambience, uh, we have those products too. And that's what we're gonna look at here today is, is kind of what we have available. Uh, get your brain working on um, on some of the different applications, places that you might be able to use this stuff. So I see that there's a few things up in the chat. Uh, we do appreciate that. We're going to continue to look at that throughout the presentation, but also the Q&A box. If you have questions, click on that Q&A box and type those questions in. We'll try and answer them as we go. Uh, and then, you know, the chat box, sometimes people have questions in there or sometimes they're just making comments. But um, uh, I'm looking through here to see um, uh, that Rob is asking about uh, microphone or camera options. I think everyone uh, is working okay, so I think it's on yeah. your end. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we're see. we're good now. I double checked with Tatiana. Okay. Okay. So we did have some here. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Some kind of a technical issue, but we've got that cleared up. And so uh, let's see. All right, we're good to go on that. So yeah, please, uh, by all means, if you have any questions, uh, click on that Q&A box and put those in there. I see one just came in. Uh, why can't I use an air handler with a multi outdoor compressor? Well, as a matter of fact, you can. And uh, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. That product is called Multi Pro. And uh, it's an awesome product. It's probably the most versatile product that we have. So, uh, Matt, keep keep tuned in here because we're going to cover MultiPro uh, a few slides down the road here, and really show you in depth what that product can do. Not only can you use an air handler, you can add a wall hung indoor. You can add multiple uh, indoor units to that as well. So it's super flexible, and uh, with temperatures minus four, heating minus 22 and uh, even minus 31 on that product. So uh, it's called MultiPro. So let's keep going here. We're gonna get through, uh, let's talk about ductless systems in general. In the beginning, you know, ductless systems have been around for a long time. They have not always been as efficient and uh, have not always had the low ambient heating that we see today. Uh, but single zone systems have been around for a long time and they were always used as kind of a spot heating, spot cooling solution where you had a room addition or maybe a basement or that hot bedroom upstairs or man cave. Like yeah. Man cave, uh, she shed, right. Yep. Uh, all that stuff. So, uh, and they're, and they're still great for that. I mean, I'll see sometimes toll booths or, you know, and when you rent a car, you know, the little booth where they check you out, they'll have uh, many splits there. Uh, I saw one on, on a trailer the other day, uh, the, it was some guy's hunting trailer and he had, the condenser on the tongue of the trailer with a generator mounted next to that and then uh they had a wall hung unit inside and uh, uh as a matter of fact uh, that same guy asked me a question about you know sometimes when he's when he's rolling around and hitting bumps and driving over rough terrain and stuff the uh the indoor units kind of rattling around too much i said just put some metal straps across the front if you don't care about opening the flap on the front just strap it down you know it's not gonna hurt anything so uh, people find all kinds of uses for the single zone systems. And um, and in the beginning, that's kind of, you know, what you had. They had multi-zone systems, but they didn't have the low ambient heating. As that low ambient heating has come available, multi-zone systems have really just skyrocketed in uh, acceptance uh, as a whole, whole home mm -hmm. heating and air conditioning solution. So uh, some Especially of the in the in the northern areas with the, the low ambient heating. Um, you know, they've got heat pumps where they've never seen heat pumps. It's really incredible. 
Yep. Yeah. Homes that were built without air conditioning, it's pretty hard to come in and retrofit ductwork and stuff. And uh, now just putting a small bundle of pipe and wire in there uh, to each indoor unit, it's become a very, very popular solution. Plus it's just, it's uh, off the charts as far as energy savings and stuff. So. And cost effective. Cost effective. Yep. Uh, so we're going to talk today about single zone products, uh, U-Match Flex, and then multi-zone products, including that multi-pro product that we were mentioning a minute ago. One of the nice things about all the wall-hung uh, units, all the mini-split models uh, with wall-hung units now have Wi-Fi built right in. It's, our, it's in there automatically. So you used to be able to add it as a retrofit. Uh, they had a little module, and they had a spot for it, a little carve out there where it would sit nicely in there, one little screw plug the Molex connector into the board and you, and you had your Wi-Fi. Now that's all in there for you. So uh, you just download the app, it looks like this, when you find it on Apple uh, Store or Google Play Store, download it on the phone and it's running uh, right out of the box. So uh, it's a real nice feature to have. Uh, we're not compatible with 5G yet. Uh, when I know they're working on it. Do we have any kind of estimate on that that you know? Of no. That? Not that I'm aware of. It's the the five gigahertz, so you have to make sure your your router is set to two gigahertz for the oh. separate band. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and I just posted a TikTok video um, of going through setting up a Vireo on the Gree Plus app. Awesome. So yeah, we've got we have uh, information on all the social media sites: Facebook, Instagram, um, TikTok. Um, YouTube, what's the other one? Oh, I don't even know. There's too many of them. I can't keep up with them. Yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have information out on all those, uh, you know, whatever your uh, desired or preferred platform is, uh, you can go out there and find information on Gree. Um, Daniel's been putting a lot of those TikToks out there. Real short, real quick hit and get you an answer that you need like really quickly. So we, we like that. Uh, these charts here are designed to just kind of lay out in, in a little bit more of a quick glance uh, what we have available. So we've got these Levo Gen 3s, and that's an outdoor unit with a wall hung unit. And those come in 9, 12, uh, 9 and 12,000 BTU and 115 volt. You also have a 9, 12, 18, 24, 30, and a 36 uh, available in 208, 230. And those are minus four heating. Uh, these products uh, are capable of heating down to minus four, but uh, products up to 19 sear. So you got a, a couple of 16s in there. You've got uh, 17, 18, and uh, 19 sear uh, variety in there uh, across those. It's nice to have those 30 and 36 uh, in some cases. And then we go to Vireo Gen 3. Vireo Gen 3 is, is very awesome. It's, it's more versatile. Uh, it's got a lot wider temperature ranges, but you do still have the uh, 9 and 12 and 115 volt in a wall hung unit. Then you've got a 9, 12, 18 and 24. And these are minus 22 heating and minus 20 cooling. So if you did need uh, to put those in a server room or someplace that needs air conditioning in uh, lower outdoor ambient temperatures, these will do it. And these are up to 26.5 sear. So these will always qualify for rebates. When you go to that rebates tab, Vireo Gen 3s will come up, I guarantee it. They're all Energy Star rated and all that. So these are nice because you can use the outdoor unit also with a cassette in these capacities or with a high ESP ducted unit in these capacities or a floor ceiling. So you've got more versatility there. You used to have to jump to the U-Match product which, um, you know, it hooks up differently and- uh, Different animal. It's a different animal, and um, and it was more expensive uh, as well. Didn't have the low ambient heating. You know, there's a number of things that make this Vireo product better. Uh, if you really wanted to settle on a on a you know specific category uh, that that'll fit all your needs, I'd say Vireo Gen Three is a real good choice there. And then we've got Sapphire, no 115s, but we've got uh, 9, 12, 18, and 24 minus 22 heating, and that 9,000 BTU is a 38 sear. Uh, if you can even imagine it, <laughs> how do they do it? You know, but uh, it's 38 sear, and then the 12,000 BTU is 30.5. Uh, after that, you know, the sear ratings really on the 18 and 24, they're better in the Vireo Gen 3 category. So uh, unless you're really chasing sear rating, um, 
and, and these certainly will qualify for rebates and that type of thing. But uh, if that's what you're chasing, then you know Sapphire is the way to go. Uh, you do have a little bit longer piping links with, with Sapphire and stuff too, which we'll look at here in a yeah. second. And then uh, we go to Vireo Ultra. So anytime you see Ultra in there, these are our minus 31 heating models. And uh, we've got a 30 and a 36 outdoor unit in the wall hung uh, that go down to minus 31 heating, 23 sear on those products. So with all these products, these are one-to-one -one match, same capacity, outdoor and indoor. And you're going to use 14-4 wire to power uh, the outdoor unit powers the indoor unit. And uh, with GREE, uh, legs one and three are power and leg two is communication. But that 14-4 wire, pretty standard for mini split installations. And then it's all flare connections. But all these models have, uh, all the wall hung models have built-in Wi-Fi. Real nice feature. And so if, uh, if you look at the catalog, go to greecomfort.com and uh, take a look at the catalog. This is what the spec tables look like in the catalog. So it shows you the different models. These are the 115 volt models. I've got those uh, uh, highlighted there. And then the 230 volt models below that. But you got a 9 and a 12. It tells you SEER, EER, HSPF, COP, uh, the cooling range. So you see uh, when we drop down here, minus 20 uh, cooling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then heating range, minus 22. So that's got pretty the impressive. The pipe sizes right there. Yep. Line length all of it line links so and uh, so all that information these are a lot of the common questions that people ask in the field they're right there at your fingertips we are working on an app uh, that you can have right there in your pocket so if you say what's the line size on a whatever you should be able to pull this information up we're working on tables too that will focus on something just like that like what's the mca and mop on those models uh, so you don't have to wade through it trying to figure out. We'll have a sheet where you go and it's, you know, MCA, MOP, boom. And uh, every model and and uh, same with pipe size, same with max line length, same with pre-charged length, uh, those type of uh, technical things. We'll try to keep those uh, isolated so that it's real easy to find and uh, just get you up and going quicker. And then these all have built-in Wi-Fi as well. So this is what you're going to see in the catalog. Uh, so I won't belabor that too much, but it's really nice to have those four indoor unit choices on Vario Gen 3. We didn't have that previously with many split models. Usually it was uh, it was an outdoor unit and a wall hung unit. So um, that's been something that I have heard for the past four years. Uh, you know, why can't I put a, a cassette with a single, you know, a single outdoor? Um, this answers a lot of questions. Yep. Now you can. Right. Now you can. <clears throat> so, uh, and then the spec tables on Sapphire. So like I was saying, you get a little bit longer uh, uh, line lengths, uh, a couple of things like that. But here's that 38 sear and, uh, you know, really good uh, HSPF and, uh, and COP. So this is the Ultra, uh, the Ultra models. These are heating down to uh, minus 31, zero cooling. And... Um, then we've got line sizes here and, and longer uh, line links, especially for that. Flex product, uh, this is a great product. We have done a grease select dealer on this here a few, a few couple months back anyway. Mm -hmm. These are available in two, three, four, and five ton. And so you have two different condensers that are field configurable. You flip a dip switch and, and the three becomes a two, flip a dip switch and the five becomes a four. And then we've got four dedicated air handlers at two, three, four, and five ton. And uh, this is an uh, all inverter outdoor unit. Uh, so an inverter split system heat pump that uses a 24 volt thermostat for interface. So this allows also these outdoor, these fully inverter outdoor condensers to be used with a gas furnace and an A coil. And a really, really popular system these days. And uh, OEM heat kits are available very efficient. These have heating down to minus 22 right out of the box without the benefit of the heat kit. Um, if you're in a colder climate, you would definitely want to put a heat kit in uh, because if it ever goes into defrost, it will continue to blow cold air inside that the outdoor unit and indoor unit don't talk. So there's no way for the outdoor unit to break that circuit. So the thermostat's still calling for heat, the fans running inside this. Uh, the outdoor unit is able to break the coil on the reversing valve and we, we energize the reversing valve in heat mode, 
So uh, the outdoor unit breaks the coil on the reversing valve and it drops back to cooling, to its standard mode of cooling uh, to defrost the unit. Uh, but while that's happening, this indoor fan will continue to run. So you definitely wanna have a heat kit in there uh, if you think it's ever gonna go into defrost. It may never come on as auxiliary heat. With minus 22 heating, you, you may never see that heat come on, uh, but you would want it uh, in a cold climate. Uh, any questions up there yet? No. All right. I'm keeping an eye on it. Keeping an eye. So uh, yep. uh, you guys uh, challenge us with some questions. Uh, uh, chances are we know it off the top of our head. Uh, if not, with virtual trainings like this, somebody can be looking. Don't tell them that, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> you can get on greedcomfort.com and find the answer pretty quick. So, all right, multi-zone uh, indoor and uh, indoor unit options. So this is right out of the catalog. Uh, there's a single zone version of this uh, as well uh, in a page before this, but uh, or maybe just above this. But I scraped out the multi-zone because um, uh, just kind of let you know that with all these systems, all the indoor unit options are, are available pretty much. I mean, uh, there's only one exception that, that doesn't allow for Levo Gen 3 indoors, but Basically, all the indoors are compatible with all the multi-zone outdoors. So you're going to have a multi-21 series, and uh, these are condensers in 18, 24, 30, 36, and uh, 42. And you've got a connectable capacity range of 50 to 135, 50 to 135, or I should say 35% over uh, the capacity of the outdoor unit. So 50% of the capacity uh, up to 35% over. Uh, combined indoor unit total. So just total up the capacity of all the B, the BTU capacity of all the indoor units you have on that job and then size the condenser accordingly. And I've got some slides to show you that, but it uh, gives you a lot of uh, flexibility and a lot of options. Any indoor style, any indoor unit capacity can be used in combination as long as it stays within that connectable capacity range. So that's the multi 21. And then when you go to the multi ultra, it's, it's essentially the same, uh, just the minus 31. Anytime you see ultra, that's minus 31. So there's no 30,000 BTU condenser in that, but uh, still lots of options. And, um, and we'll look at that in a little more detail in a couple of slides going forward. Or you can go to super multi and super multi ultra. So there's a 48 and a 56 in Super Multi. There's a 48,000 BTU in, uh, in Super Multi Ultra, which is the minus 31. With either of these systems, you're gonna use branch boxes. There's a two port and a three port branch box available. Uh, so if you need five indoor units, for example, you'd use one of these and one of these probably. Uh, you could use two, two threes and not use one of the ports. Uh, but what these do is you'll pipe from the condenser and go to a Y branch if more than one uh, branch box is needed, and then just um, split out uh, using the Y branches to the next uh, to the next box. And I have some slides to explain that a little a little better. So multi twenty one, you got a lot of uh, outdoor unit choices and all this combination of indoor unit choices. So eight different indoor unit styles. These are minus four heating up to twenty two sear, and then. Uh, uh, same same thing here. There's multiple sets of service valves on the outdoor unit and multiple um, terminal wiring terminal blocks, corresponding uh, terminal blocks. So uh, service valves A to wiring terminal block A, and then that goes to one indoor unit. And you'll use 14-4 wire for each indoor unit to power and communicate with the outdoor unit. Uh, each set of service valves will have its own uh, EEV, so each one has individual control. And um, same with multi-ultra, just the minus 31 version. And then when we get into the style that used the branch boxes, oh, uh, well, I did have a question. I was in North Dakota yesterday and they said, what, you know, uh, they were trying to stump me. So a guy asked, you know, well, what's the COP on a, you know, 24,000 BTU at, you know, minus 31. It's like, well, there's a whole table with a whole bunch of numbers on there and I don't have every number memorized. So I'm, I apologize for that, but now I've got them <laughs> in the slide deck. So this is a multi 18 uh, and uh, this is multi 24. So 
uh, COP at minus 31 is 1.16. So a little better than electric heat, right? Uh, but electric heat's always gonna be one, right? No matter what temperature you're at. So as we go up in, in uh, temperature, our COP gets a lot better. So you're still better off you know, with this heat pump. And it's amazing that a heat pump is producing heat at minus 31. I mean, that is pretty that's, amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> And that you're getting, you know, 21. It's like 000. as if heat's coming out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Out of that minus 31 air out there. But, uh, you know, 21,500 BTU out of a, a 24,000 unit at minus 31. Pretty impressive. It is. So Got a couple of questions up here, Keith, if you oh, want to uh, yeah, look yeah. at them real quick. Sure. Um, Roy's saying, when are we going to do package units? Well, uh, we're having conversations about that. Our uh, product manager, uh, Justin yeah. uh, Silsbury, has been in, uh, in conversation about that and uh, trying to just make sure that what we offer is the right fit for the market, uh, but they will be all inverter uh, package units. Huge energy savings, all electric, and, um, and uh, I'm not sure about a time frame on that. Though, but it's in the works yeah. what's the um grant is asking what's the btu output um we can get with a multi-18 12k and a 9k i think that you're you've got the perfect example on the slide right now of how do you determine that um you know you can take a look at the spec sheets and it's going to give you um it's not on this particular one when you know when paired but if you look at the spec sheet for the multi 18, there will be a, a matchup for a 12 and a, a, a nine, and it'll show you what the output is. Yeah. And they find that on greedcomfort.com. Yes, sir. Um, and then uh, Macario is asking, how does the branch box work internally? Um, that branch box actually contains the expansion valves, doesn't it, Keith? Yes, it does. And <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I'm going to, I'm going to bounce out of this. I'm going to kind of, um, hopefully it doesn't mess me up, but I'm going to, I'm going to do something different here. Okay. Uh, Cause I have, I actually have a slide, uh, on that. If I can figure out how to, uh, get to that. So let me bear with me here. Come on. And, uh, I did a, a meeting. That, that we address this very thing. Um, so is, am I still sharing? Yeah, you are. I uh, see your presenter view. Okay. Um, do you see the files I'm looking through here? Nope. I, um, Need to find this. I, I don't want to derail too much here, but uh, but we did this very thing, and I had a good slide showing the inside of the box. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm yep. going to abandon this. It's just taking. Uh, it's not right where I thought it was, so I'm going to abandon that. So I'm back to to my uh, full screen, right? Oh yeah, you are. Yep. Okay, but uh, what's inside there in the branch box? Basically, EEVs. So inside a two port branch box, there's two EEVs in there. Inside the three, there's three EEVs. So the reason they do that is to allow longer piping links. So now off the condenser, you have two pipes going inside the dwelling, and then you're gonna pipe to that branch box, which is gonna house the EEVs. Downstream from that, the branch box is gonna feed individual indoor units. And so because there is gonna be condensation in there, you do need to put a drain uh, on the branch box. Yeah. On the branch box. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But it just, it houses EEVs. I had a real good cutaway shot of it. And, uh, um, you know, maybe I can find a way to share that with you, uh, with you later, but so let's see what's in the chat box. Uh, will we get this recording? Yes. What can I do <clears throat> if the unit is installed based on cooling capacity, but the heating requirement is more than the heat pump heating. Um, uh, not much. <laughs> uh, units installed based on cooling, but the heating requirement is more. Yeah, it's uh, if it's undersized, 
it's it's not i mean it can only do what it can do right yep so wish i had a better solution than that but um and uh, what type of unit is it uh, i would ask as well if it's a flex unit maybe you can throw a heat kit in there so anyway moving on um Multi-zone products, this is super multi. we got a couple of large condensers there, 48 and 56. These are the ones that use the branch boxes. So we're gonna go two pipes out and I'll show you how this wires up as well. But from here, we're piping uh, to a Y branch or directly to a, uh, a branch box. When we use a Y branch, that allows us to go downstream to the next uh, branch box and then the ports are gonna come off the side and go to a single indoor unit. And from the branch box, so we're gonna power the outdoor unit on a dedicated breaker. We're gonna power the branch boxes. Then the branch boxes are gonna use 14 for a wire to power each indoor unit. Uh, so like it's kind of taking the place of the outdoor unit in that regard, 14 for a wire from the branch box to the indoor unit. Uh, communication needs to happen between the outdoor unit and the branch boxes. So uh, Two wire 18 gauge stranded wire is used to do that but you've got some good indoor unit choices you can mix and match these anyway these are minus four the multi ultra super multi ultra is uh, minus 31 same principle and i've got some uh, some things to show you that this is what the y branches look like up here uh, and you see how they're neck down um, for various pipe sizes so if you need that next pipe size up you use your tubing cutter cut that off and that'll accept the next size pipe up or the, you know, the next larger. Same thing on the other end to accommodate the pipe size coming off the outdoor unit and the pipe size going to uh, that specific uh, uh, port in the branch box. There's a two port and a three port branch box. And this is what the piping looks like. Do you like my piping job there? That's nice. Nice. <laughs> Fancy, man. <laughs> So, uh, but just to illustrate that there's two pipes coming off the condenser. Now that's kind of nice in a way, because now with some of the other multi-zone systems, you have five sets of pipe. You got to cover those up and make them look pretty, you know, climbing up the wall outside. So this does allow you to use a single set of pipes coming in. Uh, you'd want to insulate all this, but uh, then we're going to go to a Y branch if necessary. And it's going to pipe to this side of the, this is the same box essentially. This is where the pipes are going to hook up. And you see there's plastic caps on there holding back a nitrogen charge. You're going to want to put a drain on it. And uh, then we're going to power everything up. And then off the other side of the box, this side over here, uh, I've got it flipped around here. Uh, actually, actually flipped around because it's degrees backwards there. But uh, this is a three-port box. So you see suction liquid, suction liquid, suction liquid. And one of those ports is going to go to a single indoor unit and then I'm going to use 14 four wire between this and that single indoor unit to power it and communicate. Uh, but I can do this multiple times. And then the Y branch allows me to go downstream to another branch box, uh, which would be flipped around the other way like this. So just to kind of illustrate, uh, show you how it hooks up. Multi-Pro, this system is an up and comer. So we've got 24, 28, 36, 48, and a 60,000 BTU condenser in this series. This is 28230 single phase. Uh, most of these are minus four, uh, or you know, the first uh, few anyway are minus four. Uh, there is a minus 31 in 36,000 BTU, and there's a minus 22,000 BTU condenser in uh, 48,000. So that gives you a lot of uh, a lot of options for indoor unit choices. We've got nine indoor unit choices here. Wall hung, this is a three, they call it a 360. It, it blows out the corners as well. Uh, and this is a standard cassette. So it has a standard face frame, cut a hole in the sheet rock, put it up there. And then it's, it's got the uh, face frame to cover the hole. Uh, but there's also a compact cassette and the compact cassette allows you to lay that in a uh, uh, two by two T-bar ceiling grid. Uh, it does have to be suspended because it's got some weight to it. You know, the T-bar won't hold it, but uh, but it lays right in there, uh, 24 by 24. High ESP ducted unit, uh, we've got a single um, uh, one-way and a two-way cassette, and then those two four-way cassettes, console, floor, ceiling, and air handlers. We've got an air handler all the way up to 60,000 BTU. 
So the thing that's nice about this system, uh, the thing that I really like about this, one set of pipes, the expansion devices, devices are housed inside the indoor unit. Mm -hmm. So not only do I have indoor units all the way from a 5,000 BTU uh, wall hung. Uh, so that's by far the smallest capacity indoor unit that we have. 5K all the way up to a 60K uh, air handler and just almost any combination in between. So it's at still that same 50 to 135 um, percent of the outdoor unit capacity. Uh, but we're going to braze on these systems. We're going to flow nitrogen, but we're going to braze at the condenser piping uh, to the service valve. <clears throat> we're going to braze at the Y branch. And all we need is a Y branch to split out to the next indoor unit because the expansion device is in the indoor unit. So it's real clean. I mean, it's the simplest installation, I think. Incredible. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's really awesome. And the uh, outdoor units powered separately. Indoor units can be daisy chained on a single breaker. Um, uh, I had one system that we hooked up that was had about seven indoor units on it hooked to one 20 amp breaker and you could fire the whole thing up at once and it, and it would run fine because it's all soft start and um, it's really awesome equipment. And then you just use two wire 18 gauge stranded wire for communication. So it comes off D1 and D2 of the outdoor unit and you just daisy chain to the first indoor unit next indoor unit all the way down for communication and it's a non polar communication area network, they call it non-polar CAN. It's, it's not polarity sensitive. So even if you flip those wires, uh, communication wires back and forth, mm -hmm. it'll still work. Really? So that's incredible. It really is incredible. And it's hard to mess up, you know? And that's what we like, is stuff that's hard to mess up. <laughs> even with that, we'll find a way to, to, to mess it up every once in a while. But uh, you got real long piping lengths with this. That's what's really nice. And, uh, you know, there's other... Uh, there's selection software that allows you to um, uh, lay this out. So uh, go in and figure out how many indoor unit zones you want, what style unit you want, what capacity you want. And you just pull those into uh, like a, an empty screen, pull those over there. And uh, the, the condenser remains nondescript until you get all that put together. And, and then you double click the condenser and it tells you what size you need and all that and you can kind of you know derate it a little bit um if you need to um you know bounce to that next size higher or lower uh, condenser mm -hmm. so you you can you got some fudge room in there but uh really really awesome system so uh the thing about this is and more fancy piping you got two <laughs> wires <laughs> you got two uh pipes coming off of that just to a y branch connector and then that goes right to the indoor unit and right off you know, to the next Y branch, to the next indoor unit. And you can do this. I mean, if we're just talking capacity, so let's say we had a 60,000 BTU condenser. Uh, it's very easy math. We're going to take 60,000 uh, times 1.35. So we're going to go 35% over. The, this is the maximum allowed uh, BTU capacity is 81,000 BTUs on a 60,000 BTU condenser. That's your combined indoor unit total. If I take wow. 81 and divide that by that smallest 5,000 BTU indoor, that's 16 indoor units. Wow. So now is yeah. there, is there a max that you can connect to the multi pro as far as indoors or yeah. do you just go by the, the, the capacities? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the capacity is really the, the limiting okay. factor. Okay. So, um, EEV is located in the indoor unit allows us to do this. And uh, like I say, this is an up and comer because what you can do is, um, you know, use your imagination. I mean, uh, you're never stuck. You can always you put an air control. handler in a high wall. Yeah. An air handler in the high wall. Yeah. Cause the ductwork maybe, you know, it the, is not laid out exactly right. You still have that bedroom on the far end. That's not getting airflow. And so stick a wall hung in there. Problem solved. Right. So the rest yep. of the house is cool. And uh, now I'm sticking a wall hung in the problem areas, or you can have it below grade, have, you know, got an air handler in the basement. Um, and then I've, I've got an attic space up there that I finished out or something like that, you know, um, various types of uh, like commercial uh, situations. Maybe it's a church, maybe it's a, you know, this one, we've got an air handler up in the attic and we've got a bunch of cassettes running and, 
So the options are unlimited. And as long as you stay within that connectable capacity range and the software will will lay all that out for you. That's incredible. And the software to lay it out is is a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah, because it's as accurate as the information you put into it. So if you really know the lengths of your pipe runs, you know, you're pretty close on that. It'll give you an equipment list as well. It'll tell you you need X number of quarter inch elbows, three eighths elbows, quarter inch pipe, three eighths pipe, half inch pipe. It'll tell you exactly the lengths of each one of those mm -hmm. things you need before you go out to the job. It'll tell you wire, it'll tell you controllers, it'll tell you all that stuff. And wow. you can use these systems with uh, Modbus and BACnet uh, gateways and stuff as well. So it's, it's pretty awesome stuff. Uh, load calculations. Now, this obviously isn't going to play as well here, but I use this one as a, as a live thing. Load calculations are important, especially in commercial type applications. Uh, a lot of things that you have to consider, but I'll go ahead and share this with you, Daniel, because I don't, I don't know that you've seen this yet, but you know, if you want a system that operates at peak performance, you should do load calculation, right? So I, I share what? this what I'm doing live. <laughs> This, this is a handy little chart that we provide for you. Just print this off and then you cut out the holes and then you back up to the curb. And when the house fits in the hole, then that's the <laughs> size unit that you use. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, just, <laughs> just trying to help out, right? But this Don't is do important. this at home, guys. <laughs> yeah, don't do this at home. This is not for real. <laughs> um, but, you know, consider climate and uh, consider things like doors, windows, direct sunlight, occupants. Um, all of that. And so I was just training in North Dakota last week. I didn't put this in there just for them. I mean, it's an example I use because holy cow, it's cold up there. Um, <laughs> I mean, just this last week, it was freezing one day and then it snowed the next day. And then it was like 65 yesterday. So it's crazy. Wow. <laughs> but uh, they're going to definitely use things like uh, ultra, you know, minus 31 heating mm -hmm. flex is minus 22 multi pro. If they use it up there, they're probably not using minus four. They're probably using minus 22 or minus 31. Arizona, you know, they, they Sapphire uh, and Flex, those are rated at minus, or those are rated at 129 degrees for cooling. So if you have to put a, a condenser on a roof out there, I mean, you need those high uh, ambient cooling capabilities and stuff. So, you know, various things, right, uh, to consider. Determining, um, you know, laying out a multi-zone system is not really difficult, just a few things to consider. So this is a, a nice picture out of our catalog that shows we've got a bedroom here or a sitting room kind of thing with a cassette. We've got a room here with a wall hung, another wall hung here. It looks like we probably have some ducted units down here. So we're gonna do load calculations to figure out maybe this whole back of this, uh, of this house right here is all windows, you know? Mm -hmm. And you got a lot of heat gain and, and stuff um, and heat loss. Uh, so, so we've got to factor in for that. Do the load calculations. We're going to determine the number of zones that we need to cover. And we're going to do a load calculation and determine the style of indoor unit that we want. And then we're going to calculate the combined total BTUs of indoor units. So uh, we're going to use that against the condenser chart over here which allows you 50 to 135% of the unit's capacity. So these numbers in the 135 column are just simply 18 times 1.35 is 24. 24 times 1.35 is 32 and so on. 50% mass, pretty easy, even I could do that. And um, so basically it, it's smart to, to uh, size at around 100%, but there are some variables to consider. Uh, for example, uh, an 18,000 BTU condenser has two service ports on it. So you can only hook up two indoor units. Well, if I need three indoor units, I can't use an 18. I got to at least bounce to a 24 and so on. So there may be some factors like that. And if, if I'm using an 18,000 BTU condenser, what are the odds that both of those units are going to be calling and that both may be calling for 100% of their capacity or close to it? Probably pretty high that the odds of that are certainly higher than having a 36,000 um, with five indoor units. Are all five units going to be calling at once and are all five going to be calling for 100% of their capacity? Probably not. Because the idea here is true zoning. You know, okay, I've got one in the living room, I'm watching TV, I got that one running, 
and then I'm going to go to bed, I'm going to shut that one off, turn the one on in the bedroom. You got supply and return within the same unit, so you can close the door to the bedroom and put it all the way down to the lowest temperature and just, you know, freeze yourself out in there, right? It's just going to continue to cool. Um, so, so the odds are higher, the fewer indoor units you have, the odds are higher that you're going to probably have all those running and that they're going to be calling for a large percent of their capacity. So I wouldn't stretch it on those. I wouldn't push it to 135 because just because you hook up 24,000 BTUs of indoor unit doesn't mean you're going to get 24,000 BTUs of heating or cooling. You're going to get 18. That's the most that outdoor unit can do. So we have to consider that when putting these things together. So I always say size at 100, you know, why not? Uh, the customer yeah. will always be happy, even on the I, most extreme day. It's something something to point out on, you know, number two there, do a load calculation for each zone. Load calculation can't just be an overall. It needs to be for each zone per bedroom or, or you know, kitchen or wherever you're putting it. You need to know what the load is for that space that that unit's serving. Yeah. Yeah. And consider your design temperatures, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for that area and consider, um, you know, you might want to size based on heating versus cooling or, you know, something like that. So, which is kind of along the lines of the question that the uh, gentleman asked earlier, you know, what if we mm -hmm. sized it for cooling and that the heating loads bigger than that? Well, sorry, you may, you may be a little short. So we got about 10 questions up here. So we should probably tend to these. Um, how long of a duct run can you have? on a slim duct system and how many takeoffs? Well, um, the the uh, maximum- Manual D. What's that? Manual D. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. But um, on the mini split systems, the multi-zone systems, each individual um, single zone has a maximum piping length. And those are all listed in the, in the uh, catalogs and on the submittals and uh, you know we've got the service manuals in there, installation manuals and so on. So all that information is there, but uh, they all have um, a maximum pipe length. And then multi-zones will have a combined total maximum pipe length. And you know they have uh, a certain number of service valves. So like an 18 has two, a 24 has three service valves. So you can- Now what they're, what they're asking about here, Keith, is the the actual duct oh, work oh, of a slim duct oh yeah exactly. and okay that's I'm why sorry. yeah that's why i said manual d and you know that's the uh most important thing you can do with a slim duct is is print out that submittal sheet and take it to your manual d and do your calculation and design your duct work properly yeah. um that's going to make that system work you know efficiently and uh and comfortably yeah because they will have a static rating uh, and a couple of them yes. are adjustable uh, on the static rating, but you'll have a static rating and then um, <clears throat> it's usually fairly short runs of duct work. I, I think like, you know, 16 feet, uh, something like that. So Yeah, I, let, I used to use the example of hotel room with a closet and that thing mounted above it in a vent cut above and then a vent on the door. Yeah. Um, think of that as a slim duct and what it's designed for. Yes, you can put duct work on it and, and make a transition of the supply and return. And, but you, you would have to make sure it's limited. The, the static is limited on those. So you want to make sure that you've <laughs> designed it to where you've got uh, the proper airflow. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Ryan says, uh, um, Free comfort has AHRI matches on flex coils. Do not see cut sheets on any documentation. Just free offer cased A or N coils. It can be used to do a fuel setup, third party coil. Um, so yeah, we do we do have AHRI matches. I don't I don't know. Uh, I think there's documentation out there, isn't there? On uh, on greencomfort.com. Um, they're still working on the uh, case coils, I believe, but there is, they are listed. Yeah. And uh, uh, the A or N uh, is that dimension? Because we've got, uh, I think we have A, B, and D, don't we? Yep. They've actually got Flex A coils listed on the website. And we've got uh, install and owner's manual, parts manual, AHRI certificates. And it's, uh, 
the Flex 24 um, with a 36 outdoor, you know, obviously you switch it to, to match the two ton. And then Flex 36, Flex 48, and Flex 60, those, those A coils are listed there. Um, and so the next one, uh, just asking about 14, four wire, that is a uh, 14 gauge four strand wire. It'll have, uh, you know, red, white, black, and green in there. And I've got some examples on a couple of slides coming 600 up. 600 volt rated. 600 volt rated. Yes. Yep. What line links would a branch, uh, be used and would this eliminate EEVs at the outdoor unit? Yeah. So. Uh, the line lengths on the branch box uh, style units are much longer. I want to say 164 feet, something like that. And uh, yes, it eliminates EEVs in the outdoor. They are housed in that branch box. That's the kind branch of the box. whole idea is to yep. move them downstream so that you can get longer uh, piping lengths. Plans to alter ceiling cassette to be mounted between 24 inch and set of trusses for residential. Um, well, I would imagine that the compact cassette uh, could, well, I, I, I don't think there's, uh, yeah, yeah, there is difference in dimension of compact cassette. They're taller, you know, they keep that 24 by mm -hmm. 24 dimension and then they're uh, taller, but without the face frame, I'm not sure that you can mount that. So uh, you'd have to look at the dimensions. Yeah, yeah, we'd have to look yeah. at the dimensions, and those are out there. Maybe we can take a quick peek at that and uh, give Tyler an answer before we get done here. Are Zoom Lock press fittings okay? Uh, yes, they are. I got some slides on that. Uh, let's see. And and the reason for that, you know, the Zoom Locks, well, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the slide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is the selection software? It is... Um, uh, being worked on. It's not out, pushed out there yet, but... Um, it basically allows you to just lay the system out. It'll give you a piping diagram. It'll tell you the, um, you know, you populate the indoor units that you want. Then you click on the condenser. It'll identify that and tell you which one you need. You can kind of select which one you want as well and, and you know, see if it works within the parameters. But if you're accurate on the piping links and things that you put in there, uh, or even if you're not, it'll tell you the pipe size you need off of the condenser to that first leg of the Y branch. It'll tell you what pipe size you need from the Y branch to the indoor unit and going downstream to the next Y branch or indoor unit. So it's, um, it's pretty awesome, uh, but it's not out there yet. When it is, we'll make a big splash and, and show you uh, how that works. Is it a bad idea? to oversize capacity for cooling, to achieve heating capacity in colder climates? Uh, no. Will it cause moisture issues? Um, I mean, uh, oversized air conditioning is oversized air conditioning. These will modulate down uh, a bit and, um, and uh, there may even be settings at times, lower fan settings and stuff that you can do to uh, wring out more moisture. Stress on the compressor lining at low speed for cooling. Um, they're, they're designed to, to withstand all that. I mean, the, w within the fan settings and stuff that they offer. Mm -hmm. they'll be able yep. To and there's dry mode depending on the model. Yeah. Yeah. Dry mode. Yep. Will, yep. will help you, uh, remove some moisture. Looking quoting systems for two story, 16 square hundred foot home. Only a 1600. <clears throat> Anything job specific, make sure you look, reach out to your um, local grease sales rep and get them involved in, in helping with the design of that. Yeah. Cause, cause we'll, uh, have to take up Tyler's question, uh, outside of here. Uh, pipe for design help for a specific job. Yeah, we can help. Um, so again, uh, how do they get in contact with their, uh, just get in contact with your local distributor and, uh, mm -hmm. yep. and call rep. your local distributor and get, uh, Ask them for a, a grease sales rep contact. Um, and then, you know, if, if you're not sure who that is, um, look on the website. There's the uh, distributor finder. You can find who's local to you. And, um, you know, uh, worst case, I'll give you Keith's cell phone and <laughs> you can call him. <laughs> call, call on the weekend, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's no problem. 
So, uh, and then Mark Richardson's asking, can we talk about wired controller compatibility chart uh, and multi-zone that is on Greek Comfort? Yes, we can. Um, we'll, we'll see if we don't cover it uh, coming up, but then um, if you have a more specific kind of question, we'll, we can kind of drill down on that uh, for you maybe as we go here. And what is dry mode? Um, it, it, it helps uh, with humidity control, right? It slows down the fan and mm -hmm. brings out moisture. Yeah, it, it locks the fan in low speed and it actually uh, increases the, the uh, kind of, I guess you could call it, refer to it as dead set. Um, so it increases that range of, it'll cool uh, like five to six degrees below set point. It'll let it heat up, you know, back up set point. It'll cool back down again five or six degrees below set point kind of alternates yeah. so that it's removing um uh more moisture obviously because the fans speed set to low and whatnot yeah and then uh nathan's looking at the greek quick reference guide uh vireo plus heats up to minus four your sheet says minus 22 uh vireo gen 3 does minus 22 yeah. so uh you know the yeah, the Vireo Plus is different from the Gen 3. Yeah, so uh, take a look. And, and if it is a uh, uh, misprint on that, then uh, we'll, we'll get in there and correct that. And let's see, please, questions on Q&A. Ends of the flares, or do we have to braze pipe and branch box? Um, yeah, you, you um, there are flares on the branch box itself, but when you use the Y branch connectors, you do, uh, you do braze those. And you have to flow nitrogen when you brace. All right, so let's keep rolling so that we can get through some of this. Uh, Multi-zone matching. What what this chart here is, it's it's similar to what's in our catalogs, but uh, I just did the math on the combination. So uh, if you have two nines, that's 18, right? If you have a nine and a 12, that's 21 and so on, just to make it a little easier for product selection. But let's say that you have decided in your application that you want three nines. Nine plus nine plus nine is 27. So which condenser do I use? Well, uh, I wouldn't use an 18 because I need three indoors and it only has two sets of service valves, plus a, the maximum is 24,000. And like we talked about, what's the odds of this thing, of, of you know these units on an 18, two indoor units running at full capacity both being called for and running at full capacity, probably pretty high. So I certainly wouldn't stretch it. Uh, for 27,000 BTUs, uh, I need three indoor units. I got three sets of service valves on a 24 and I'm only 3,000 BTUs over. So, you know, and uh, 32,000 on the high end. I think I'd probably be okay with that. I might want to jump to a 30, but 24 will probably get it done. Um, but what if I think I want to add a nine later? I may want to add a nine later. Well, this only has three sets of service valves, so I would then at least have to go to a 30 because uh, I need 36 total. I, and that allows me to stretch it to 40. May not be running all four indoor units at once. And even if I was, would they all be calling for 100% of their capacity? I might be able to get by with 40. But in my, in my house, I would use a 36. Why not just size to full capacity? Then no matter what day it is, no matter how hot, cold it is, extreme temperature, whatever, I'm gonna be able to produce 36,000. I can run all those at full bore uh, anytime I want. So just some things to think about when you're sizing. Um, add up the, the combined total. And these charts make it easy. Uh, these are in the, in the catalog these charts are pretty easy because I'm like, okay, I need a nine, a 12 and a 12. What can I do? You know? All right. Well, I got to go here. I can use this. That's 33,000. And so I'm going to go here. You know, this one only goes 32. So I can't do that. So I'm going to have to at least go here and, you know, 33,000. I'm only 3000 over again. You know, you're going to choose between one or the other. If you think you want to add capacity later, uh, it, you know, it's a good idea to bump up. You don't have to hook up to all, you know, all the ports. You can leave one open. And the other thing is, let's say you had a, a problem with an EEV down the road and you had an extra port. You could actually, instead of mucking around changing that EEV, you could take those pipes and, um, and move them to another uh, port, um, you know, just as a 
safety net down the road. So um, this is what the piping looks like, more of my beautiful piping. Uh, just to show you that the service valves are numbered or are, are lettered out there, uh, A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And there's a corresponding terminal block that'll be A, B, C, D, E. And so just one set of pipes to an indoor unit, and then uh, same corresponding terminal block to that same uh, single indoor unit. Uh, you can mix and match any style indoor unit, any capacity, as long as they stay within that connective capacity range. This is what the service valves look like coming off the side and um, uh, pretty easy if you're doing, and we'll use a single zone as an example, but to figure out where to place the evaporator. Um, for me, I always look for an exterior wall because then you can drop your pipe wire and drain outside. You don't have any concerns about drainage and that kind of thing, um, or at least as much concern about drainage. Uh, on an inside wall, you'd have to hook up a condensate pump and stuff, which is easy enough to do. But this is from our catalog and you can see the outside coming in, right? So these pipes and wires have been dropped outside. They're running along the back of the house to an outdoor condensing unit. The rate limiting step is usually that indoor unit, figuring out where you're gonna put that. So we're gonna uh, figure out which wall to put that on. And then if you can keep the condenser within 25 feet of that, you don't have to mess with the refrigerant charge. But then also consider maximum piping, consider things too like prevailing winds, um, anything that might, uh, minimum just, pipe length. Yeah. And minimum pipe length as well. So wall hung unit, we want to leave some space around the top because that's where it's going to draw return air left side, you know, uh, not as much concern as the right side. This is where all the pipe and wire and circuit board and all that stuff is all over here on the right side. So if you ever need to get in there, you're going to need to do it through the right and just get it up off the floor. Um, as high as possible. And then um, we're gonna mount the bracket. The bracket is not in the center of the uh, unit. Now it comes pre-installed in there. There's a little screw that holds it in there. Uh, that's all it does. You can throw that screw away, but uh, it's not centered because there's more weight when facing the unit, more weight on the right-hand side. So they offset it a little bit to help uh, uh, Balance. counterbalance that. And so you want to leave the bracket on there, lay a tape across the back, lay it on its face, lay a tape across there and mark the bracket wherever that center falls. And it won't be in the center of the bracket. That way, when you have your spot on the wall, your bracket will line up in, in the proper place. Uh, you are then going to drill a hole in the wall, uh, a big gaping hole that scares homeowners when the daylight comes through, right? <laughs> Two and a half to three inch hole for your pipe and wire to drop through. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna uh, take some steps to make that look pretty for them. Seal it all up. When you drill that hole, you want to make sure that you're below where the drain tube is on the indoor unit, and you want to make sure that it goes outside at a downward slope. You don't want water that may sheet down the side to infiltrate back in the house. So that will help with that. Uh, and you want to have your drain uh, tube at the very bottom uh, coming out. Just think in terms of water drainage uh, when you're when you're laying all this piping in and uh, drain and everything. Uh, water doesn't go uphill, Keith. It doesn't. No. Wow. Not without a pump. <laughs> Not without a pump. So so we definitely want to consider that when we're uh, doing this because water will drain down the wall uh, inside if you don't, and that's not yeah. a, a popular yeah. thing. So uh, I like to I like to take the cover and and put it you know hold it up where it's going to be like the outer cover off of that indoor unit because yeah. it's going to be easier to install it once it's all removed and just mark to make sure i don't go too low with that yeah with yeah my... that's what i do as well yeah so uh once we have everything pushed through this hole uh we're going to want to uh, fill that with uh foam expanding foam to prevent moisture infiltration unwanted air infiltration that may throw the sensor readings off Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't want to squirrel inside your house either. So it's probably best to foam that up. Um, looking at it from the back, the way they're shipped, the drain tube is usually over here on this side. All your pipe and wire and stuff is on this side. Uh, looking at it from the back, uh, it's on, uh, you know, left. Just a little note on the previous screen, Keith. Um, so the, the um, not only do you want to seal that hole so squirrels don't get through there, but if there's infiltration, 
it's going to affect the temperature that the indoor unit is sensing because that sensor is right there. It's right there. Um, so if it's pulling a little bit of hot air from outside, then it's going to be way too cold inside according to what you've got the set point. Yep, set hot point. air, cold air. Yeah. So you definitely need to foam that thing out and seal it up. Uh, so the drain hose, this is the way that it, that it shipped. So we've got our pipe here and our wire is going to hook up here. There's a little drain plug uh, here, a, a stem that sticks up and it has a plug in there. And then our hose is hooked up over here. So we want to move the hose. I, I mean, you can, you can make a connection with drain hose and tape it up and everything if you want to. Um, but you run the risk of, of any kind of a leak there running down the wall. So I, I've never put one of these in and not moved the drain hose over to the other side. I understand Vireo Gen 3s, they've done that now. The, the drain hose comes installed on this side. Mm -hmm. So uh, we appreciate that. But uh, there's a little clip in here and this little ring around the side, it's not a spring clip. I thought that it was the first time I tore one of those up trying to get it out of there. All <laughs> you I just twist do, it. <laughs> all you have to do is just spin it, just twist it. And yep. this, little, this little keeper right here will twist off this little post. You do have to kind of work the hose around a little bit. Uh, it's real dry rubber against that against this plastic. Uh, so you have to kind of work it around a little bit to get it off there. Be cautious. Tape. That's be cautious. Yeah, because you can that, tear up the hose. I can tell that's part got, of the drain pan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I can tell they got a little aggressive with this hose here. And uh, <laughs> you, know, you got to kind of take it easy. But this is what it looks like. So there's that sensor. And so this is what Daniel was talking about. If we have a hole with our pipe and wire coming through right here and we got hot air or cold air infiltrating, hitting the sensor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's gonna throw the, uh, the inside temperature off. It's gonna say, okay, I need more cooling and it's already freezing in there, you know? So, uh, but this is where your wire is gonna hook up. I hook up the wire first and then I, I shove all that wire through the hole going to the outside because trying to get your wire through and clamp down and get it hooked up in the front afterwards. After the fact, yeah, it's difficult <laughs> to me it's a lot easier to do that up front and just shove it through the hole and then push the unit on the wall we're going to take out this drain plug and you see there's a little recessed hole in there uh when you pull the drain plug out it comes out very easily it's best to wet it and you're going to go back to the other side where we pop that drain hose off and push it down in there and i usually use like a torx bit or something like that put it in the hole and seat it down there real good just to make sure it's not going to leak um Please don't use an ice pick. It's not a good choice in the tool <laughs> for pushing the drain plug back in there. But, uh, you know, then we're going to button it up. We're, uh, you use 5 8 drain hose. Most of the places will have corrugated hose that you can drop right out of there. And uh, this is what it's going to look like coming out the wall. And we're going to make sure that the drain tube is at the bottom so it drains well. And then we're going to foam it up and put some kind of a line cover over it. There's tons of stuff out there. Uh, cover guard I just saw it there's nice looking product uh, they've got fortress and they got line hide and slim duct and all kinds of stuff right rector sale yeah lots of choices so uh, these are the little aspen pumps uh, very nice if you want to uh, if you do mount this on an interior wall you're going to need to run that condensate drain out somewhere and these little mini aquas mount right inside the drain pan of the unit uh, uh, mini white underneath here. We've got a, uh, these lime ones sit right in the corner of uh, uh, line cover stuff. If you do have that hooked up or they have these, uh, you know, just a number of different choices. Uh, ducted units and cassettes do have a built-in condensate pump that pumps mm -hmm. about 39 inches. So enough to get it up and gravity drain it out. Uh, if you do hook up a condensate pump, you want to break leg three on the wiring. And uh, so let's look at some refrigerant uh, piping and some outdoor unit installation. We wanna leave room around this thing. You gotta draw air. So we want space uh, around the left. We want space around the back and uh, no obstructions out front. Leave a little bit of room around the right in case you ever need to get in there. Installation manuals, service manuals, submittals, AHRI listings, everything you want is out there on greedcomfort.com. Case in case your knee uh, uh, got this one dirty and you can't read it anymore. Right? <laughs> Refrigerant piping. So uh, these all need these 5 16 adapters uh, to get your quarter inch hose on there. There's one uh, access port on the suction valve of a mini split. 
and uh, it's five sixteenths fitting. So you got to have an adapter, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, torque our line sets down, and we're gonna talk about that. We've got a lot of stuff here going forward, but uh, uh, and let me know, Daniel, if we get to a point time wise, I'm gonna keep going until you tell me to stop. But <laughs> uh, well, you know, we we I've got all the time in the world for this. This is excellent material, and you know. We've we're at twelve ten right now, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna post the recording as well. If if you can't hang around yep. uh, to finish it out, so glad yep. that everybody's able to be here uh, live, but you'll still have access to it. So, so we do appreciate your time. Uh, so this uh, this is out on GreekComfort.com as well. It tells you the adapters that come with multi-zone units. And uh, this is really important because both indoor units may have a larger line size than the service valves on the outdoor units. So the outdoor units are always quarter three eighths on every multi-zone and um, indoor units may have, you know, a, a quarter half line or, or a three eighths, five eighths line uh, going to them, depending on the capacity of that indoor unit. So this is all worked out in this manual. This is this section here. Uh, these adapters come with the units. And so we'll use an 18,000 BTU as an example because it's the easiest to kind of understand. It has two sets of service valves and the combinations that are allowed, because if you remember from our slides a couple, couple slides back, 18 times 1.35 is 24,000. So I can put as much as 24,000 BTUs, that's a maximum I can put on an 18,000 BTU condenser. Well, if I'm using 9,000 BTU indoors, their line set size is a quarter three eighths. So mm -hmm. I don't have to do anything. It matches with the service valves on a multi-zone unit. I just pipe right from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit and I'm good to go. If I use a 12,000 BTU indoor, the line size on that is quarter half. So now how do I make that three eighths service valve half inch? Well, I use the adapters that come with the unit. And in, on an 18,000, they give you two three eighths to half adapters. My quarter inch liquid line's fine. I just go right from the condenser to the indoor unit. But that other line uh, on the indoor unit is half inch. That unit wants more refrigerant. That's the way I refer to it anyway. That unit wants more refrigerant. So we have to mm -hmm. give it more refrigerant by giving it a larger line from the condenser all the way up to the indoor. And they make that very easy for us by giving us two three eighths to half inch adapters. So now I can have a quarter half on one 12,000 and I can have quarter half on the other 12,000. That's the maximum allowable. They have all those combinations worked out. So like on a 42,000 BTU, you get nine adapters. So if they come with the adapters, you don't necessarily have to use them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if the, line, if the size, line size is proper, according to the indoor. Right. Line sizes match up, you're good to go. But uh, otherwise, every combination has been determined and you have every adapter that you could need uh, for that application. But it's still a good idea to save the adapters. Uh, if you're putting in a lot of these after a year's time, you could have a lot of uh, uh, money in copper alone, right? Copper and brass. <laughs> or, or if you just need it for whatever reason one day, I always it's, save it's the easy. extras. Yep. Throw them in the toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is an example of what it will look like. So quarter, you know, quarter three eighths, quarter three eighths, quarter three eighths, all the way down. So on this quarter three eighths, I'm going to take that adapter, screw it right on to the service valve and torque it down. I'm going to use the torque wrench. I'm going to follow the specs. I'm going to torque it down. And then I'm going to bell up to the other size. Now, uh, uh, with that example we were using, you wouldn't use an adapter on the quarter. You just go to the quarter inch line on the indoor but you'd use a three eighths to half inch adapter here and uh, you'd screw it on there, torque it down, screw your line set on here, torque that down. I'm gonna use a backing wrench and a torque wrench and make sure that I have this torque to factory specs. If the outdoor unit is 30 feet above the indoor unit, we're gonna need an oil return bend every 20 feet to get oil back to the compressor. And then we wanna make proper flares. Um, so, uh, we have a lot of people that uh, that believe in nylon blue. We uh, uh, I had it on this slide. So sometimes I have it. Sometimes I don't. We're not trying to promote products, uh, you know, here at Tradewinds. We're trying to 
tell you what some of the best practices are that we believe things that we may have used and tested and tried. And um, uh, I was just training in North Dakota and distributor up there was all about uh, nylon. So I, I included it in there. Great product. Excellent product. Yeah. So uh, grease systems use mechanical uh, flare fittings. We know that. And uh, uh, making good flares, it, this is the number one problem in many split installations or any system using flare connections, leaks at the flares. So we want to make good flares. We want to visually inspect the flares. And we want that bell on that flare, the width of this shoulder here, we want that bell to be as wide as it can be and it still have the nut foot fit on there. These are examples of good flares, this and this. But you, you can kind of see a little line here, a scoring line in there. And there's, there's mm -hmm. some light scoring on this one as well. Because anytime you have two metal surfaces grinding against each other, you know, so you got a, a cone on a flaring tool that's trying to force that copper open, spinning against each other, you're going to have some kind of scoring that occurs. Well, we can minimize that by using some PVE oil on the cone of the flaring tool. Mm -hmm. And then uh, even with these good flares, we still have a little bit of uh, scoring going on. We like Nylog because it never hardens. It's made from refrigerant oil. And even if some got in the pipe, it's going to break down, become soluble in the refrigerant uh, moving through the system. And it's not going to plug up your EEVs and your, uh, your strainers and that kind of thing. So, so we're okay with it. It can, it can help improve the uh, seal. And um, do you have a 40, I mean, everybody's got a 45 degree flaring tool. They've always been 45 degree in uh, HVAC and R, always and forever. What determines the width of the bell on the flare is how high the pipe is above or below the block. So if you have an old flaring tool that may not be gripping the pipe as well as it used to, you're jamming that cone down in there, could it be pushing the pipe down into the block a little bit? If so, you're not going to get as wide a bell on the flare. So a good, you know, new tool, it's worth the investment because one callback pays for a tool, guarantee you. Yes. Uh, we do like these uh, eccentric cone, the one that, that kind of spins around as it spins uh, concentrically. So uh, that helps take a little bit of stress off the copper and, and eat, lay that flare out. Uh, the flare gauge here is used to, to measure the width of the bell after the flare is made. And uh, so please don't be like me, make sure you put the flare nut on the pipe before you make the beautiful flare. <laughs> I've never done that before, Keith. Yeah, yeah <laughs> never. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's an interesting little thing too. Uh, inside a, a cutter, have you ever seen the the cutter wheel? There's a little gap in there. Mm -hmm. That's made for putting the bell in that gap, so that you can cut it off. So like you don't have to move all the way to the inside. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, it's sad that I know that. <laughs> 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 but. Um, but we do like the, the, you know, when they say a 410A flaring tool, they'll have a stop on there. And, and that is helping to make sure that the pipe is in exactly the right spot above the block to make, that, uh, to make that good flare. And you can use the flare gauge to measure the width of that afterwards to say, okay, it's as, it's as wide as it can be. You can pull the nut up around the flare and look at it and stuff as well. Uh, is there a difference in the size of the width of the bell? Maybe. Um, uh, Yellow Jacket says there is this 60278 flaring tool. Uh, it's the one with the blue handle. It's kind of a big contraption looking thing, but it's, it's a really nice tool. I mean, it makes a great flare, but they, like on a three eights, for example, they say it makes a, a standard tool makes a 0.488. They say theirs makes a 0.520. So is the width a little wider for the 410A? Maybe. I know the flare nuts are different. Like if you buy a line set, the, the flare nuts are lighter, you know, they're smaller and lighter than the ones that we provide with the systems, right? The ones yeah. we provide are pretty big and beefy. And, and so, and, uh, and, and could that 10th of an inch make the difference between a callback or not? It could. Good. So, so, you know, it's, it's probably worthwhile to invest in a, in a new tool if you don't have one. These are some things that can happen in the field, you know, splits in the copper. Maybe this bell was too wide, uh, something like that. Uh, this, I know they didn't use a uh, flare nut torque wrench there. They were twisting on that pretty hard mm -hmm. and uh, snapped the flare off. And I've uh, done exactly that before. 
Yeah. And so that can happen. You know, that's why a flaring tool is, is, I mean, a torque wrench is so important. And this may be an example of, like we said, with the block that wasn't gripping the thing well enough. If that tube pushed down into the block, this, this bell on there or lack thereof, this was never going to seal. There was no way that flare was ever going to seal. So then they went to the step of, you know, we'll put some leak lock on there. Well, that leak lock is, is bad because it hardens. And if that gets in the piping, you're going to plug strainers and EEVs and everything. So uh, again, you know, just a, a newer tool with the stop will help you eliminate callbacks. We've got a few uh, questions up here. Keith, you want to oh, go over a few of those? Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Um, we've got any configuration needing three pipes. I think they were referring maybe to the multi-pro. Well, um, they're referring to really heat recovery. So um, so we actually do have those systems. So uh, uh, on our commercial side, the VRF products, mm -hmm. we have uh, uh, 28230, three phase and 463 phase VRF heat recovery systems that use that that include a hot gas pipe and then with those systems you use a uh, they call it a mode exchange box it doesn't house EEVs like like the branch box it sort of looks like it but it has solenoid valves in there and that hot gas pipe is sitting right there at the ready and it's in closer proximity to the indoor units so uh, that's the system that allows you to have simultaneous heating and cooling and when you call for heat, the solenoid valve opens, hot gas flows to that indoor unit. Um, uh, the next port over on the mode exchange box could call for cooling and you got a suction liquid pipe and a hot gas pipe. That one calls for cooling and it gets, uh, gets immediate cooling. So the stuff that we're talking about here, no, we don't need uh, three pipes. The only system that needs that is the VRF heat recovery system. And that's the only system that'll do simultaneous heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. So we don't have anything on this more residential side that uh, that will do that. It's all heat pump. So let's see the whole location is not dimensionally correct in diagrams. Of, yeah, uh, one thing uh, that I uh, neglected to mention. So they do they do have some hole placement um, on the on the diagrams and stuff with the bracket. You know where to hang that on the wall. What I do, and I failed to mention this, hang the bracket. And then I take the indoor unit and kind of hang it up on there. Don't pop it in, but hang mm -hmm. it up there and then take a pencil to the inside a little bit and just draw a line around that bottom right. That way, when you get ready to drill a hole, you know that the unit's going to cover it. Uh, otherwise, you yeah, I, you know, I've had that question come up several times. And honestly, I don't care how good a diagram it is, if it's exactly correct, if I personally put it on the wall. And, and measure it out according to the diagram for whatever reason it's i'm just going to be wrong it just is the way it is <laughs> so like you said putting that unit up there knowing exactly where it's going to be and drawing that pencil line on the wall is the surest most positive way because i know once i put the unit back up there it's going to cover that yeah 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 because uh I, I, you know, that's hanging that unit up there is reality in the, the diagram, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, so <laughs> that's how I do it anyway. Any thoughts on flare seals? Um, I like the rector yeah. seal, uh, the purple ones. Yep. I've used those before. Um, really good success with those. I like them. And uh, the torque spec on that uh, you just kind of went uh, what what did you do uh, uh, you i went to the i went to the high end of the torque spec just because to me you know once you put something in there you you're going to need to torque it a little bit tighter so i just went to the high end of you know there's a about five five newton meters difference between the you know it gives you a between uh, so i went to the high end of that yeah and you haven't had any problems. That system's no. been installed for a while, right? It's been installed uh, for a year and a half. Nice. And uh, and Grant, uh, same gentleman, says always use nylon. Um, I agree. And then uh, let's see, thoughts on ProFit Quick Connect uh, unions and flare options. We like those as well. I got slides mm -hmm. coming up here in just a couple slides. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So uh, I own this um, yellow jacket kit up here, this blue one. 
And uh, it's these heads here, it's kind of interesting. What these are is the difference in size between those, those factory line set flare nuts and our flare nuts. Just, you know, ours are a little bigger, a little thicker, mm -hmm. a little heavier mm -hmm. uh, for the 410A and stuff. So they actually have separate heads in there for those. So I say cut those smaller, lighter weight ones off. Use the ones that come with our equipment. Yes. Uh, good way to go. Um, the only drawback. I've got the Black Max one. Yeah. And, and this opens up to, it doesn't open to an inch and an eighth. I just looked at it yesterday. We put it on no, a three quarter no. inch nut. It may open to seven eighths. I'm not sure, but it definitely opens to three quarter. Uh, the only drawback on this kit for me, the yellow jacket, it's a beautiful precision tool. I love it. If it ha if they offer a three quarter inch head at some point, I'm going to buy it because if you're going to put in flex systems and I, I recommend that everybody does the inverter uh, split system, this doesn't have a three quarter inch head. And uh, I put one in at my son's house and I had a leak on the indoor three quarter connection. I used this crescent wrench on it and I uh -huh. tightened down. I was like, okay, I think I'm good. And I, had, I actually had a leak and I know I took my time with the flare and I know that it was, you know, a good flare. And uh, I came back later and bared down on that thing, just cranked it down. And now I haven't had a leak since. So uh, torque wrench, first time I used it, putting a quarter inch fitting. Uh, I, I wanted to stop because I didn't want to break it. It felt like something was mm -hmm. going to break, but I knew the wrench was set right and would break over. So I kept going, trust the wrench. And I had to go quite a bit further than I thought uh, before it got to the torque. And I thought I would have left that too loose. Then on the bigger fitting, it broke over before I thought it was going to. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that yeah. Too tight. So you can't feel it. I mean, a lot of guys say, oh, I just feel, you know, and do this. I've been doing it for a long time. Okay, great. If that works for you, fantastic. But I trust the wrench and the right setting, you know. So uh, we do we do recommend, you know, using PVE oil. That's what's inside the system. So it's fully compatible. POE works okay. Please don't use mineral oil or anything like that. But uh, on the flaring cone, a couple of drops on the threads and maybe even the backside of where that flare nut uh, contacts the copper on the backside of the flare. Uh, can help it to not bind and uh, and just get just get a little better uh, uh, connection there. Prevent that leak at the flare nut callback, which is the biggest problem with the mini split systems. We don't like any of this stuff. Anything that will harden could get in those strainers and plug the EEVs. Uh, one guy had a leak and called me up. He was real proud afterwards. He says, yeah, I had a leak on there, but man, I put a bunch of that Teflon tape on there and cranked it down and now it's not leaking. I was like, okay, good luck. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. But, um, that's not the right way to do it. You know, use the torque wrench and, uh, and that's, that's the right way to go. Uh, anything on those chats that we need to address, uh, Daniel? No, no, the, the Q and a box is empty. Okay. Um, so please don't use side glasses. They won't do you any good. Their refrigerant is in saturation in weird places in there. Uh, if you put one of those in and try to charge by that, you're gonna overcharge the system, no question. Solenoid valves can only cause problems. Uh, additional schraders or things like that can only cause leaks. Anything that's necessary is already in there. Anything additional is, uh, it can only be problematic. It's not gonna help you. So now here we are to the fittings as we were talking about. This is called Zoom Max. And these are the ones, it's a, a perfect flare over here. And then you crimp this down. Uh, this is a, um, uh, they have ProFit and they also have mm -hmm. Zoom Max fittings that do this as well. This is a perfect flare. I, I got some samples of these uh, in my bag and uh, I like to show them you know, at the, at the meetings and stuff. Uh, they're rated at 870 PSI. There's the testing so far has been very positive. And to me, the worst thing that can happen with this is you could have a leak and you can have that with a bad flare. So this being a perfect flare every time, right, has taken at least part of that uh, out of people's hands. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about making a perfect flare. Sometimes you're in there at an odd angle with the flaring tool, trying to get it in there and make a flare and stuff like that. Well, you don't have to worry about it with these. Screw it onto the fitting, torque it down. Uh, with these, it's like a shark bite. You shove the pipe in there, right? And, um, and it seals up 870 PSI. So this is what it looks like inside. And we're only, 
we're only dealing with half of this fitting. This is a union. We're not going to use a union on our systems. We're going to use a socket that has a threaded flare on one side. Mm -hmm. So we're going to eliminate part of that. But on the other side where we shove the pipe in, this is what it looks like. Pipe's going to shove in there, lock in uh, a couple of O-rings in there to hold the seal. Uh, you stick a tool in there and, and it makes the pipe removable. With the, with the Zoom Max, uh, same thing, perfect flare, torque that down. But now we're going to crimp this in. Um, and, you know, you got to ask the question, do you trust an O-ring more than a flare? Do you trust a flare more than a, than a good brace? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. But if this gets you by, and like I say, so far, so good, uh, testing has been very positive. So we're okay. The biggest, thing, the biggest thing that I like about these few products that you have here is, and, and this is something I've seen a lot of people cut the flare off of the indoor unit and then braze it. That causes more problems than it ever saves you. Um, because a lot of times, you know, if you're not following best practices for brazing, not flowing nitrogen, if you're not careful with the quarter inch, you're going to create a complete blockage um, of that line. And, and then, you know, you're back there uh, troubleshooting, trying to figure out what's going on. And it's, you know, in the wall with sheetrock already done and that sort of thing. This doesn't require like the, the pro fit, um, the zoom lock, the fittings with the flares already there. You do not have to alter the factory design to use these products. So, you know, it's up to you as a licensed contractor to choose what works best for you. But always keep in mind if if you're altering the product, then, you know, there's there could be a problem there. Yeah. So. Uh, but we like them OK. So um, uh, use some good. Uh, uh, benders and things like that when you're bending pipe. I saw these yesterday live and in person. Um, guys say they work pretty good. Just make sure to clean the uh, uh, tubing, ream the tubing mm -hmm. so that, you know, when you, they're plastic, you know, so if you shove it in there, that could be pretty sharp and it can kind of shave some of that off, uh, usually on the outside, but nevertheless. Uh, but you shove these in there and then it, it shores it up so that it can't kink. And so you can bend by hand. Um, I, I like this crossbow style bender. That's my go-to tool. Um, made pretty tight bend with that on the um, flex system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with a three-quarter pipe, I had to make a pretty tight bend and uh, all worked out fine. The next thing we're going to do is, is leak test. We're going to pressurize with nitrogen and use some good bubble leak. Uh, and this is going to be uh, after we make our piping connections, we're pretty confident everything is uh, is hooked up right and uh, and our, we're torqued our fittings and everything's good. We're going to we're going to blow the lines out with nitrogen. Then we're going to pressure test with nitrogen at 500 psi and soap everything. So soap your your hose connections and you know every every uh, uh, port that's uh, got something hooked up to it you need to soap all that yep. up flare connections everything yeah and so uh we're gonna we're gonna pressurize with 500 psi and nitrogen and hold it for an hour so you need to make sure you have a regulator that can deliver 500 psi uh i've got a turbo torch that's 800 psi like this or the diaphragm i also have a 600 psi uh, from western enterprises this one's kind of interesting because there's no diaphragm uh, it's got four settings, off, braze, purge, and test. Basically, you just click it into place. So if you're brazing, now you click it to braze, and it's just going to flow a nice little amount of nitrogen so you can braze and, and not have problems, um, not have oxidation buildup in there. Purge, you blow the lines out, and then test. It's going to give it the full uh, test so that you can pressurize with nitrogen, bubble leak it up, just use a good bubble leak, and, um, and let that sit for an hour. Once you're convinced that uh, there's nothing, uh, that there are no leaks with the pressure test, then a vacuum test. And I mean, they can show you different things for, for sure. Uh, so use use a micron gauge, definitely use a micron gauge. Um, what is a but, micron gauge, Keith? <laughs> simple or fancy, you can spend as much as you want, and, uh, uh, but don't spend too little. And uh, we're gonna target uh, 400, but uh, we're gonna pull it down to at least 500. And, um, and it's good to use a vacuum rated uh, core removal tool. When you're pulling a vacuum to get that restriction out of the way, that Schrader is, is causing quite a restriction there. 
get that out of the way. You'll pull it down a lot faster and um, use a good pump and, you know, change the oil. It, it really does make a difference to uh, change the oil in the pump. Uh, I used to go, I used to have a rep when I was working in wholesale, a guy would come in and do vacuum pump clinics. And I mean, people, people, this is like pouring out. It looked like motor oil chunks. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> it's supposed to be clear, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, you got to change your oil in these things? I was like, yeah, <laughs> makes a difference. So um, then we're going to evacuate. Now, this is a system that uh, that our friend Daniel here actually put in at his folks house. And uh, notice that the liquid line is not insulated on this flex system. Uh, this is the inverter split system uh, air handler. And uh, there's a TXV inside there. So when you're putting this in more like a conventional system, you don't have to insulate the liquid line, but he, uh, he got his new fancy JB fast vac uh, kit with the JB mm -hmm. pump and uh, put yep. a couple of micron gauges on there. And, and the Schrader this valve removers there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so uh, pulled this down in no time. Um, in these flex system, the indoor unit is holding back a refrigerant charge, actually. So these service valves are closed off and their service valves on the outdoor unit holding back a refrigerant charge. So you have to pull each line. He's pulling each line independently. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you put uh, gauges on there, you could do it that way as well, uh, because these systems do have two sets of service valves and there's an access port on each on all four uh, service valves. Uh, but we're going to evacuate. Right outdoor. Yep. Uh, when we're putting in a new system, we're going to pull it down to 500 microns. Uh, servicing, we're going to pull down to 250. But we always have to charge by weight. And so uh, that's with any grease system. So there's going to be a factory charge um, that, uh, you know, is a uh, pre-charge length. And then as you add additional feet of piping, you do a calculation how many feet times the whatever the calculation uh uh, is maybe, you know, 0.2 or 0.32 for the, uh, for the flex systems per foot. And uh, you're going to weigh that in. Uh, so if you put an extra 20 feet, you know, times 0.32, you're going to take that amount of refrigerant, uh, put your cylinder on the scale and weigh that in. Uh, sometimes you may have to uh, shut the system down. Usually when you evacuate the lines, it's enough to pull in what refrigerant you need. But uh, uh, you may have to shut the system down, let those uh, expansion devices reset and uh, and reopen um, to ensure that the thing takes some gas. But you can't charge by gauges. I mean, the uh, superheat and subcooling are all done internally uh, by the by the logic of the system. So um, minimums always ten feet. Um, precharge length is usually twenty five. Uh, multi zones will have longer precharge lengths, and then there's some maximum value which uh, changes by capacity uh, of the system. But this is for piping rules for the uh, refrigerant or for the uh, multi-zone systems. So we've got 18, 24, 30, 36, and 42 here. And you see max total pipe length. So these are the maximum lengths, combined total length of all indoor units that you can have on these systems. Uh, somebody asked about that earlier. And then the factory charge. This is on the rating plate of the system. So if you ever need to recharge the system, uh, you're not sure what's supposed to be in there, it's right there on the rating plate. And then you also have to add any additional piping length above this figure here is uh, max pipe length without adding refrigerant. So on an 18,000, there's 33 feet of pre-charged uh, length in there. So as long as you stay less than 33 feet, and some people say, you know, well, what if it's less than 33 feet? Do I need to remove refrigerant? No, no, you never need to remove refrigerant from a grease system. And then some people say, well, what if I put a line set of less than 10 feet? And I say, don't put a line set of less than 10 feet. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> we got to have some parameters, you know, some dead stops. Uh, if you'd it, like to be the engineer and test it out. <laughs> yeah. Go uh, for it. <laughs> so we have two, uh, two questions similar. Is it equivalent uh, piping length? is it max total pipe length for only the liquid line? And yeah, it's just, uh, so if you added 20 feet, you wouldn't use 40 feet for your calculation, you use 20 feet. Right, right. So you I could think, measure either the liquid line or the suction line, it doesn't matter, but you're not doubling. Right, 
So um, I think that answers both questions. But anyway, all this is in the uh, installation and service manuals. Now, this is the fanciest slide on the whole thing. I'm, um, I, I, I <laughs> usually run this one twice because it, uh, it's so good. But uh, refrigerant additional charge, 410A is a blend, right? So uh, you have to invert the cylinder watches, you ready? <laughs> oh, do it. That fancy or what? That's incredible. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you mean you have to turn the drum upside down? Yeah, and otherwise, you know, uh, you can have, it's a blend and it can disturb the blend. And so that's why if you have a leak in one of these systems too, you don't know what portion of what gas leaked off. So you got to yep. pull it all out, way back in fresh gas. Yep. Uh, but that was a fancy slide, man. You got to admit. <laughs> that was awesome. So in liquid form, the blend is correct. But in yes. a gaseous form, you don't know what the blend is. That's correct. So um, wiring best practices, uh, we say, please no wire nuts or uh, splices. Uh, one guy pointed out for me yesterday when I was showing about wiring a condensate pump, he goes, you show a wire nut right there. I was like, yeah, I know. That's the only exception, you know, but I don't know. But that's not, that's, that's for, that's for the, the condensate pump, not for the communication. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have a good explanation. I said, well, that's the only exception, but uh, yeah, yeah, I like your explanation better. Well, the, the, the number two wire, you never want to involve it in a condensate pump. And the number two wire, you never want to involve it with a wire nut or a splice for that matter. Yeah. Um, actually, Richard, uh, our test lab genius, has, has been doing some testing with the, the communication. And um, he actually did a test with a uh, crimp connector, wire nut, and solder. Um, and when he, what he did with the solder was he actually pushed the wires together, um, individual strands, and then soldered it and put a heat heat shrink wrap over it so the the wire nuts um uh it caused a big resistance difference the crimp connector caused a resistance difference the solder caused no resistance difference huh. so you know if you did have a situation where you just you got it ran and you were a little bit too short the only possible way you could possibly get around that would be to solder it or pull a new wire well, yeah, good information. And uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen. Um, <clears throat> Brad Davis actually helped us out uh, here too. And, and it's a really good point. Uh, but he says, with those quick connects, just mm -hmm. make sure uh, that you don't have any barbs on the copper because it can, you know, uh, uh, tear or, or score or scar the O-ring. Oh, definitely. Just like a shark bite. Yep. Yep. You just got to make sure and deburr that tubing and then, uh, and then they'll work good. So thank you for that. We, we appreciate all, any questions and comments because we incorporate that into future trainings. Uh, you know, uh, we're all just trying to make this better and, and help you guys out and get quicker answers and more solid information. So keep them coming. So uh, for wiring, you know, we're going to have a disconnect and, and a whip. <clears throat> we're going to wire to L1 and L2 and ground on the outdoor unit. And then that's gonna allow us to uh, provide power to the indoor unit through the outdoor terminal block in one, two, and three. And then we're gonna go to the indoor unit corresponding in one, two, and three. So this is an example of that 14-4 wire somebody asked about earlier. It doesn't have to be south wire. We're not trying to promote products. Just we've used it, it works. Uh, other stuff works too. You just have to make sure that it's 14-4 so 14 gauge, four strand, rated at 600 volts. Um, they have definitely had uh, issues in tech that they were able to figure out uh, was caused by not using the properly rated wire, E6 error codes mainly. And, and stranded copper. And stranded copper. Yep, yep. no solid. Yep. So, it'll work, but it'll give you an E6 eventually. Yep. So we wanna be careful about splices and broken wires and that stuff, make sure we have good solid connections uh and and it's best to figure out a, a standard color coding system that works for you uh red white black that's what we use red white black red white black and that way uh once you get used to seeing that all the time it, it'll make it easier for you to figure out a problem if you're having one 
So by using that color coding system, I've got red, white, black here, red, white, black, and uh-oh, I've got a problem here, right? I've got white, red, black, and this is going to give me an E6 communication error every time. The mm -hmm. most common cause of an E6 error code is this right here, right at installation, somebody got a wire crossed up. If you have multiple indoor units, you know, on a multi-zone system, you got five indoor units going, it can be easy to cross up a wire here or there. If you have a different person working inside and a different person working outside, you know, so if you see an E6 while you're installing it, it's, it's probably going to be this. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time. If the system has been running for a while, it may be something different. And we have um, troubleshooting deck on this that, uh, that covers all that. But so this is what it looks like inside uh, N1, 2, and 3. You can't see it really well, but you can see it on the outdoor unit. Uh, I know this is a 24 because it has three terminal blocks on it and three corresponding uh, sets of service files. The only uh, multi-zone that has that. Uh, indoor unit, you can't see the A there, but indoor unit B, indoor unit C. That corresponds with the outdoor uh, service files, red, white, black, red, white, black, and uh, common ground terminals. And there's usually little green screws in various places mm -hmm. to let you tap on uh, uh, ground wires. This is the multi, uh, super multi and super multi ultra with the branch boxes. So you need to power the outdoor unit separately, dedicated breaker there. Uh, then you need to power the BU boxes. Can those be daisy chained on the same breaker? Yes. Yes. The, the BU boxes, like if you're powering from your first BU to your second BU, um, you can power those from the same breaker. Yeah. As long as it's separate from the outdoor, because it's it's not because it needs to be separate. It's just that you need to have the correct size breaker for the outdoor and then the correct size breaker for the BU box itself. Yeah, um, it's I only think, it's less than 15 amps, I believe. Yeah, I, I, that's the thing. I bet the amp draw is really super low. Yeah, and that it is. I figured you probably could. Uh, just like indoor units on that multi-pro system. I mean, like mm -hmm. I had seven of them hooked up and it worked fine. So I just didn't want to tell people that if I didn't know for sure. So, uh, but yeah, so you can, you know, dedicated power here, dedicated power here, then daisy chain those together. And then those BU boxes are going to, are going to in turn power the indoor units on N1, 2, and 3. So just like a mini split outdoor powering the indoor unit, N1, 2, and 3 here, N1, 2, and 3 on the indoor unit. Uh, you know, indoor unit A. So use the appropriate, uh, uh, make sure that the wires are going to. Uh, and, your, and your line set needs to match up with the wire of which one the unit's going to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So indoor <laughs> unit A will also be corresponded to the. Uh, to the piping A. a. Yeah. And then um, uh, our communication between outdoor and the branch boxes is on this N1 and 2, same thing, uh, two wire, 18 gauge stranded wire, and we just daisy chain. They have terminal blocks available to daisy chain those. And they're actually marked, you know, outdoor unit and then BU module right. going from one to the next. Yeah. Yep. So uh, if code requires, you can use one of these three pole switches uh, for a disconnect for indoor. And uh, the three pole switch is heavy enough for our uh, in one, two, and three. So we'll have our power and uh, on one and three, and we'll have communication in the middle. Make sure and keep those consistent as well. Uh, otherwise, you'll end up with that E6, but uh, that'll allow you to, to cut power um, to the indoor unit if it's required by code. Surge protectors are a good idea. Um, we use surge protectors for our TVs and computers and everything else. Why not on these? Uh, there are some disconnects that actually have surge protectors built in. If you need a line monitor, uh, line monitors are available that will actually record the voltage at the time of fault um, if it's outside the parameters. You can set the parameters of, of when you, you know, where you want it to protect. It'll tell you the actual voltage at the time of fault. Some will even tell you the time of the fault, which, uh, you know, maybe it's happening during peak time. It's happening every day, you know, at a certain time or whatever. So it can help you figure out some of those issues. You can even install them as like a, a service tool, uh, temporary, you know. Got to make sure and open both valves. Otherwise, you'll get an H5, right? Probably. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, 
And on a multi, open all the valves. <laughs> all ten, yeah, if there's 10 of them, you know, yep. it, it could be easy to overlook one. And, uh, and uh, no, you know, no major deal. All you got to do is open it up and it'll clear that uh, fault code. So um, the auto temperature is adjustable uh, on these Vario Gen 3s. And then they've, inclu they've included a... Uh, an auto clean function. I haven't seen this in action, but uh, uh, turn that on and it, it says to, you know, clear the room of, mm -hmm. you know, children and small animals and stuff. And then <laughs> it's going to, it's just, not that bad, <laughs> but it's all it. What's that? I actually uh, did this test the other day because I've got a Vireo gen three behind me on the wall over here um, above the mountain, big one? you know? Yeah. Doing above the, the mountain there. The yeah. Is. Cool in the mountains. That's why it's so cool in the mountains. Um, so I, I just, I did it when I first installed it and we're, you know, but I did it again because someone asked and what it does is uh, it'll, it'll turn on in cool mode and it'll frost the coil over. And once the coil is good and frosted over, it switches to heat mode and then it steams the coil off. Oh, wow. So, yeah it's yeah. kind of clever yep okay it's it good is. to know that because because i hadn't seen it in action so i just uh i figured it was just blasting air through there as fast <laughs> as it could. so that might be a, a great feature you know um so we'll see how that shakes out some uh of the most common uh things that homeowners ask are are listed on the back um auto manual button so open the lid and you can uh, hit the auto manual button if the remote is uh, is missing does mm -hmm. that come on in this at the same temperature that that the last temperature that it had so it saves stuff in eprom memory or does it override and, and do another temperature it just does a, a the standard auto setting so if you push the auto manual button it puts it in um well in cool at 77 degrees so it'd probably say 77 on on the display and then you know it'll it'll switch over from heat to cool and keep it within a certain range yeah and then you know have them look in the couch cushions have them look in the refrigerator yeah. you know, <laughs> the places they may have left it um so we do have a an xe72 wi-fi solution for all non wall hung indoor units we have some of these in stock and uh, this is a wired controller that allows you to use it with a cassette or a ducted unit or you know any non wall hung and uh, make that wi-fi and hook up to the gree plus app yep and uh, so here's some of the features on that Vireo gen 3 this is the one that allows you to use four different indoor units minus 22 heating um, minus 20 cooling, and this is actually up to 26.5 here. I noticed that, uh, and I'll make that correction. You need but, to fix um, that, Keith. I know, I'm falling down on the job, man. And this is a one-to-one, -one, so same capacity indoor and outdoor using the 14.4 wire for communication, all flare connections, built-in Wi-Fi on the wall, anyway. But you can use that XE72 now. In the you know owner's manual, they'll use that's owner's manual slash installation manual. They'll they'll have some plugs for the drain pan if you need to run a centralized drain and, and drain it off. Maybe it's hanging over a sidewalk or something of that nature. Uh, you can you can do that, but it's best really to make sure, especially if you're in a snowfall area, get it up off the ground, leave those out so it can uh, defrost and drain completely. A uh, nice feature that they've done here is move that return filter on top and makes, makes for a lot easier access and a larger return area um, coming across that coil. So a little better performance of things as well. Um, the, the, just a funny note on this is I've had a few calls that the filters didn't come with the new unit and it turned out to be a Vireo Gen 3. Yeah. They open the front cover and they're not there. You don't see them. Yeah. It's on the top. On the top. So. Yep. Uh, so nice, uh, nice features that they're trying to do for us to help life, uh, help make life easier, especially for you guys. And this is all input that we give them uh, all the time. You know, we're constantly uh, talking with the engineers and, and um, uh, trying to make improvements for you in the field. This is the best one of all. Uh, now, all you have to do to get to the board on the indoor unit 
is lift the lid, take this screw out, this assembly pulls out, and uh, the whole board, uh, you can just pull it right out right there. So now if you have certain tests that you need to do, uh, you know, you want to pull a Molex connector off and, and check something, a component or, or something. A sensor or whatever, you don't have to pull the whole cover off. Yep. Accessible right there from the front. And, uh, and the motor is a little easier to get to as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So great features. Inside the uh, service manuals, they give you detailed instructions on disassembly of the unit and um, consequently reassembly and uh, really nicely laid out. And then there's other things too. Uh, if you go to support, go to the parts lookup. This is a new section and they're doing a great job with this. I probably need to update this because this is a few uh, several weeks back that I did this, but I just typed in three VIR and you got this whole list of all the uh, Vero Gen 3 products. I chose a 9,000 BTU. This is the first tab here, product info. There's a hundred different uh, spec items on here. You know, you want to know what the wattage is. You want to know what the refrigerant charge is, the type of compressor it has in it, the dimensions, the keep naming it, right? hundred different pieces of spec info right there in front of your face. You just scroll down. Anything you need to know about it is right there at your fingertips. And then you go to a uh, product parts list, you get the exploded views and below that a detailed description of each of these numbers um, so that you can find the parts that you're looking for. If you're still in question, then you go to this page. And uh, this is where I say I need to update because I guarantee you they populate a lot more pictures in here. Um, yeah, it's yeah they're new... constantly adding new, <laughs> new pictures. And the, the idea is that this is the picture of the actual part. Yeah. So a lot of yeah. times now they're not all there yet, but we're working on it yeah. that you can actually see, oh yeah, that is the one I need. Yeah. So if you're looking for a circuit board, especially, you know, now I can do a visual comparison and say, yep, this is the board, right? Um, so just trying to make life easier for everybody. So uh, we've got three more questions out here. Let's see. We've gone a little long today and we appreciate you guys hanging around, but uh, uh, any questions at all, like I say, help us make this better for you. So do you need shielding for wire? No, I mean, not required, not required. And, uh, you know, could there ever be a situation if you're having problems, there's, uh, you know, some kind of uh, interference or something that may be causing you a problem, but I don't know. I don't know that I've ever run into it. Have you? No, no, it's, um, you know, it may be necessary just depending on the environment, um, yeah. depending on what you're dealing with. Yeah. If you put one in at NORAD, you know, yeah, you might need some shielding. <laughs> you might need some shielding but, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, okay. Uh, I always use, so Grant always uses alphabetical order for his wiring, whatever you use. I like is it. Great. That's cool. Yeah. Just, you know, because, uh, Whatever your system is, it'll help. It'll let you know at a glance, you know, that uh, that the wiring is not set up right. We chose uh, red, white, black because red and black are generally power, and uh, and you know, white generally being a neutral. White, a neutral, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but whatever system you want, uh, I don't know if I'd use green for a power wire though. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't do that simply for safety reasons. Yeah, I you know. I like to think of the next guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he reaches in there and gets bit. Uh, does it matter where the disconnect switch for the indoor unit is? If you had, uh, okay. Um, if you had to splice, could a terminal block be used? Uh, if you had to splice, I, I, I mean, I imagine a terminal block could be used, you know, to screw that down tight. It's just making a solid connection, but we don't want to do that with the, uh, with the communication wire, right? With yeah. Two. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it makes sense that it could be possible, but why would you want to do that? Um, yeah. yeah, best to best to make sure that you've got, you know, a, a good wire from indoor to out, so there's no issues. Yeah. And the first part of that question though says, does it matter where the disconnect switch for the indoor unit is, if it's required? Um, yeah, what, only if it's required, and then you just follow local code. Follow local codes, but it's usually within arm's distance, just right there in close yeah. proximity to the indoor. Within unit. within sight, line of sight, or you know whatever it is that they put in the local code yeah. as the requirement. Yeah, the local code is definitely the thing. 
And uh, what's the scoop on M1 and SEER2? I, no I, comment. Yeah, I know I've heard some stuff about that, but I, I don't personally know enough about that to really uh, to really <laughs> answer. People ask about refrigerant, which way are they going, you know, and this and that. Some of that's getting pushed out, which I like, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Tr trying to drive changes. EPA doesn't know what that does to us in this industry to just try to force changes. <laughs> we're, like we're all asking questions. What's going on? Yeah, um, but yeah. I know most of the ductless manufacturers were, were moving towards R32. I know we've done testing with R32. And now because, you know, carrier is usually kind of the driver here, right? The leader and with the 454B, they're, they're pushing that pretty heavily. So now we have um, uh, all Asian mini split manufacturers really saying, you know, oh, we might go with 454B. So we don't know. And now they push, didn't they push it out to 2025 or something like that? You know, I, I honestly haven't been keeping up with it. Uh, Gree's using it across Europe and Australia's using uh, R32. Um, I, you know, I believe Justin, the last time that I asked Justin about it, he said that once they determine, you know, what it's going to be, then we'll make a statement about it yeah. and let everybody know. Yeah. yeah. I would, I would hope that we could all get together and, and not have like two or three additional added drums that we have to keep in the van. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so yeah, pretty soon you're going to have to have a trailer just for all your tanks. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Roy is saying USA use red, white, and whatever, no blue. There's actually some cables that do have a blue wire. Um, just depending on the manufacturer and that that's my thought um, I actually had a contractor was talking to him a few years ago and he told me he said I always use red white and black or you know because there is no blue um, I said I like that red white and blue patriotic um, it's easy to remember it's a cool way to go but whatever your color code system is, uh, keep it the same. <laughs> keep it the same because that'll help you figure out those problems quickly. Uh, but I will tell you, we really do appreciate your guys' time today. Um, Thank you, everyone. Yep, and we appreciate the questions. It helps us make training better, and um, and that's our goal is to make your life easier. So, thank you guys all. Go for install being some here. grease systems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for being here, and we will put this out on uh, on the web. Thanks, Keith. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Take care.